Hello everyone and welcome back. Welcome back to the Cybersecurity and Cloud Podcast. This is your host Francesco and today as a really special episode. I've been waiting to uh, send this one out and I had the absolute pleasure to talk with a veteran and a fellow startup uh, and a fellow CEO, AJ, AJ Yorn that is effectively the CEO of ByCheck. And uh, AJ comes from a background similar to mine, so cloud security. And also he's been involved in a lot of cloud security consultancy and he decided to start a war on compliance <laughs> and to make it sucks a little bit less and to effectively uh, keep up um, with his technical knowledge and uh, effectively start, a, uh, if you want, a... Uh, an argument with all the people in the traditional compliance world that uh, keep on saying that compliance is not technical, it's not a technical field, while de facto with cloud security nowadays, compliance it is. And I am super, super happy to interview AJ because we are <laughs> we are in a similar journey and uh, with AppSec Phoenix and AJ with uh, Bycheck. It's been kind of meeting a brother that is on the same journey, is facing the same struggle. And uh, we've been discussing also the, the, the power of networking, LinkedIn, and AJ is one of the uh, top voices for uh, LinkedIn uh, for last year. So it was an amazing honor to talk with him. And I really hope you enjoy this episode because I had so much fun uh, talking with AJ. So I hope you enjoy, stay safe, and make that compliance suck a little bit less. <laughs> Thank you. Enjoy. Welcome to the Cybersecurity and Cloud Podcast, where we hear the stories of information security professionals. This podcast explores different angles, out-of-the-box ideas, and the human element of cybersecurity. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts and supporting us at www.patreon.com forward slash CSCP so we can continue to bring on amazing guests. You can watch videos of the interviews at www.cybercloudpodcast.com. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cybersecurity and Cloud Podcast. This is your host, Francesco, and today we have the absolute pleasure to have a fellow entrepreneur, a fellow cloud security fighter. And of just this year, I think, AJ, you've been, uh, you've been nominated as 2020 LinkedIn Top Voice. So we're going to explore everything about that journey. And you're also the CEO of ByCheck, a super shiny new startup. So please tell everybody everything about that. But maybe for who hasn't heard you on LinkedIn and who is not well connected um, with, with LinkedIn or with you, do you want to give a little bit of background about yourself? And welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. It's, uh, I think it's going to be a really good conversation. So my name is AJ Yan. I'm the co-founder and CEO of ByteCheck. And I started my cybersecurity career in the U.S. Army, where I served in the Army for about six years as a signal officer. Uh, ended up leaving the service after making captain. Uh, I decided I didn't want to sleep outside as much as I was anymore and, and wanted to stay, spend more time in the United States. So uh, I got out and I went and worked at a cybersecurity compliance firm or consulting firm uh, where I was really focused on like SOC 2, ISO, HIPAA, High Trust, the full alphabet soup of, of compliance frameworks. But super exciting one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, I A lot of the work that I did was on around cloud security, um, cloud security architecture, and really getting in at the foundational level for companies and figuring out how they can set up their cloud environments in a secure manner, which it exposed me to so much, you know, being in consulting, you work with a bunch of different companies, you see yeah. different challenges, different personalities, and you see all the different cloud environments. So I was just exposed week over week to these environments. And as I was seeing the growth of the cloud and the, and, and the growth of security in the cloud, I became more and more interested, more and more obsessed with, with figuring out better solutions for cloud security. And one of the solutions that I came up with is, is related to bite check where uh, doing these compliance assessments, you know, you realize that they're really manual. Uh, there's a lot of documents exchanged, a lot of screenshots, long meetings with auditors, all this stuff. 
And, you know, we've all seen an evolution in technology where automation is so important. Everything in cybersecurity, you hear automation, automation, automation. But for some reason in compliance, we just haven't got there yet. We're not automating it. We're still old doing school. things old school. Uh, <laughs> so that's why I started Byte Check. was trying to figure out a way to really focus on the technical aspect, connect directly to where this evidence lives, and, and be able to actually get security value out of these assessments. Right. I mean, I think that's what's really important. And I'm sure we'll talk about that later around compliance and, and whatnot. But you know, my journey, if someone would have told me 10 years ago that I'd be a CEO of a software company, I would have thought you were absolutely crazy. Um, so it's been a really fun journey. It's really cool that in the cybersecurity space, how fast you can grow and how much mm -hmm. you can learn. And it's really up to you is what I've learned in my past 10 or so years is that it's really up to you how much you learn and, and how far you grow. The sky is the limit. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And it's an amazing field. But we have a long-standing tradition in, in the podcast that we ask our guests at the very beginning of the podcast to give an overview of the industry. And, and you dripped here and there a, a little bit of message. But if you would kind of give your opinion on kind of the compliance aspect of it and the state of the cloud security, in your opinion, what will that be? What, what will be your opinion on, on where we are? It's an exciting time in the industry because there's so much focus on cloud security. So much awareness right there, right now in the industry around cloud security, which means there's opportunities for businesses, for people, more importantly, to, to start a successful career in this field. And I think that's one of the things I think about and one of the things I've been talking to with a lot of people is that this is the time to learn about cloud, learn about cloud security and, and get into the field because companies have rapidly moved to the cloud. There's that meme that goes around that's like, who has accelerated the digital transformation at your company? And it was COVID-19. Yes. <laughs> companies were were delaying moving. That's the new C. Yeah. <laughs> the new C level, that that uh, the new digital transformation C exactly, level. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So it's that's the part where all these companies rush to the cloud. Now they need to figure out how to secure themselves in the cloud. And that's where there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity for people, but there's also an opportunity for organizations to take advantage of the cloud and Absolutely. take advantage of the nature of these interconnected components and build a really secure architecture. I think there's a big myth in, in cloud security that the cloud is less secure. And I actually think that the cloud is more secure. I think the issue is that people just don't know how to properly configure things, but you can really lock down your environment if we wanna get super technical and nerdy, we can, but you can really do some things in the cloud to really lock down your environment that you probably wouldn't be able to do in an on-premise environment and definitely not with a small staff. Right. So, you know, I think the, the state of the industry with the awareness that's going on it adds a lot of potential to really grow and stop a lot of these bad things from happening in the cloud from a cloud security perspective. So I'm excited about it, especially from a compliance perspective. I think governance and compliance is a great way to get into the technical field. It's less of a, a learning curve from a technical perspective. You don't have to learn Python to become a compliance associate analyst. Um, you know, you can slowly get there. You don't have to be a solutions architect. You can slowly get there. So people oftentimes when they're trying to get into tech, First thing they say, I want to be a pen tester. It's like, all right, well, look, everybody can't be a pen tester, okay? Like, you, you know, that's a special skill set. Everybody can't be that. Maybe, you know, you just learn about a little bit of architecture and you help people, you do consulting to get your feet wet. And um, I'm, on the, I'm a founding board member of the National Association of Black Compliance and Risk Management Professionals. And one of the things I do there is really just try to expose people to cybersecurity compliance and expose them to what that means and how it works, because I think it's a great way to get into the field, um, especially when you start to combine some cloud knowledge and governance knowledge, you become a very rare, rare person. No, I agree. And uh, as you mentioned before, probably in, in a couple of articles or podcasts, I, I don't remember, but you mentioned that, and, I, and I've seen that, that compliance is still a very old school and they, they almost look at you like uh, in a bad way if you are technical. It's like, are you technical? Do you don't like spreadsheet and paperwork? <laughs> you bad, you yeah. bad for this industry. <laughs> Why do you think is that? I think it's, um, it's a lack of of understanding uh for so long this uh, these audits were done one way and i think it's it's the way that we've kind of seen things transform over time you know when apple first released the touch id everybody's like oh i'm not doing that i'm not giving them my fingerprint that's no i'm just going to still use my passcode and now everybody's just holding their phone up and letting <laughs> their face unlock their phone because you're so used to it right. and you know there's stories back in the days about 
when ATMs first came out and all these times in, in, in society where transformations were taking place, but there was this one segment of the industry that was just waiting. And I feel like compliance is that way in cybersecurity, where everywhere else, you know, we see all of these SIEM tools out there that are doing all this automation. You see all of these monitoring tools that can monitor something, pick it up, remediate it, and send you an alert all in within a matter of 10 seconds. Right. But compliance has been behind. And I think it's a matter of, like you said, auditors are not typically technical. They're looked down upon, actually. You're looked on as weird if you're a little technical. And using automation requires you to be technical. It requires you to know a little bit about the technology. And they and I think that that knowledge gap causes the the aggression against it where you don't want to adopt the technology. But the with everything in, in all of our business, customers customers drive what you do. And customers of these auditors are not going to let continue to have manual assessments. They're just not, they're just not because it takes too much time. And everybody had to reduce their budget. So, you know, there's not a bunch of security professionals on staff to manage a compliance assessment. So you're going to have to figure out ways to use technology. And I think something that's changing, at least this might just be my point of view, but I think people are really looking to get security value out of compliance assessments. And I don't think you can- I really like that point. Yeah. And and I I don't think you can get security value doing it in a manual fashion. I don't think you can manually inspect an AWS environment. You, you you don't know. You don't know what's in another region or what's out there or what's in a random. Well, you could, but it could take like an army of people. And <laughs> right, you know? right, right. You want to make too much money because you'll be spending so much time looking through every segment of, of AWS. So I think to get true security value, to make the audit more efficient for both the auditors and the client, you have to use automation. So it's one of those things where you're going to have early adopters, people that are coming on board and, and ready to automate. And then you're going to have the people that are lagging behind. But eventually, it's going to be like the iPhone. Everybody's going to be holding up and unlocking it with their face. Everybody's going to be automating compliance because it's just it, we don't have the time and the threats are too, too widespread to not do this. You have to. And we saw that in, in application security growing and growing the speed and the, and the challenge of actually being on there with code and releases and things changing all the time. But cloud security has, hasn't picked up as much because maybe you have a lot of old school infrastructure people or old school uh, professional coming into the field and really being scared. I mean, cloud is scary. Cloud is scary. Yeah. It's very new. And there is a lot of nuances that, uh, I mean, you have, at the fingertip, control of the entire data center. And mm-hmm. you could, yeah. it could give you an enormous amount of power, but from great power comes great responsibility, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but maybe, how did you, how did you evolve in, in this cloud security journey? How did you decide to, you know, jump from, a, 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 if you want, a consulting, a consulting world to, I'm going to take the leap and I'm going to be a CEO and I'm going to create something new. What, what did push you and how did you, if you want, grow in that that process? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was, so being in consulting, you you get exposed to a lot and you see a lot. So I was working with a lot of startups. So the, the startup bug started to bite me a couple of years ago, just being around startups and you see the way their culture is, you see how everybody's really relaxed and it's just really scrappy and people are moving fast. And you kind of, it reminded me a lot of the military, the small Mm close-knit community there. So that bit me, but then I, you know, I'm, I'm a very intentional and organized and kind of process oriented person. So I knew when I first got the startup bug that I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to go and start my own thing or I, or, or try to even do something as an entrepreneur. I knew I had to learn a lot more about business, about the industry, about a market, about even coming up with an idea. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the things that helped me is that even though I had the itch to start my own company a while ago, I waited until I had a lot more figured out. I didn't just try to jump right into this. And I, you know, this being an entrepreneur is hard. It's very difficult. And I, I would struggle if I didn't know the industry and know, some of the things that I'm doing in and out and I know them intimately, I would, I would be very, I would be struggling a lot. So I think that the journey of understanding that I had to learn more helped me be focused about what I exposed myself to while I was working. You know, what, what was I doing in sales process? How was I learning about how to interact with customers? What did I learn right. about the challenges that people were facing on a regular basis and, and the way things that they complained about what was I thinking about ways to, to fix these things? And then 
I'm a, I'm a pretty decisive person once I make a decision. So I made a decision probably last last fall, I believe it was around October, November that I was like, yeah, I'm going to leave. I'm going to do this. I don't know exactly when yet, but I'm going to leave and I'm going to uh, go ahead and, and take this chance. And then I, I made the leap in, in February and, and started working um, towards this thing back in March and, and through the pandemic and all of that. But so it, you're it was a really public company. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a badge of honor. Yeah. I think yeah. I think it needs to be it needs to be worn as a badge uh, of honor. So you had the the startup bugs, and when was really the, the revelation of like, okay, I have enough of corporate life. I need to jump on this train. I'm I'm ready, man. I'm ready. I need to do that. So I started to realize two things. One, I I grew really fast in my past role. I was able to get promoted. I I was able to be, uh, you know, control my schedule, do all the things you think about that you want to do. I made as much money as I ever made in my life. I was doing really great, but I realized it didn't mean much. Mm -hmm. Like it didn't mean much from a family perspective. Like the money I was making was great for me, but my extended family, my brothers, my sisters, my mom, they weren't really impacted by me um, making this money. I was able to buy cool shoes and buy my kids whatever they wanted, but it wasn't really impactful beyond them. And then even from a happiness perspective in my life, I'm most happy when I'm creating and when I'm challenged and when I'm building things. And when I kind of got into this grind of just the same old stuff, the same old corporate things, I realized I lacked that happiness. I wasn't enjoying what I was doing anymore because I wasn't building anything. I wasn't facing new challenges every day. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I love cybersecurity so much is because it's so challenging and you constantly are just, you're you're constantly failing. I, I mean, I tell people that all the time. I'm like, the times that I have the most fun in cybersecurity is when I have like 50 stack overflow tabs open and I'm trying to figure something out. And it's because it's like that journey, it's like a scavenger hunt of just trying to figure out ways to do things. And you see, when you start to go, that's the thing I think about most people don't understand in cybersecurity. And it's the same way to me in entrepreneurship is when you start doing really getting deep in cybersecurity, you realize how much more, how much everyone else doesn't know either because you just start searching all these forums and you're like, Oh, he has the same exact problem. I had literally the same exact thing that I'm going through. He had two years ago. And it's like, it's cool because you realize you're not alone. Um, and in entrepreneurship, everybody's kind of making it up and, and, and going alongside along the way and, and trying to find solution along the way. Exactly. And I feel like it's the same way in entrepreneurship. Like, you know, you, you get into this little community where people support you and they understand the grind, they understand what goes into this. And that's cool as well. But I think it's, it was, it's my personality, my personality. I'm a builder. I'm a creator. I like to, uh, I like to solve really hard problems and I like to take chances. I'm a risk taker. I jumped out of airplanes in the army. So I, I am not risk adverse. I, I, I really enjoy the thrill and that adrenaline rush and entrepreneurship, as you know, it's a daily adrenaline rush. Yeah. You know, every day is the most important day ever. Every bad thing is the worst thing that can ever happen. Every good thing is you're going to be the greatest thing ever. <laughs> so it's like that, that roller coaster, roller coaster. to me, it's fun, man. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And, um, I, I, I knew, so that's the thing about it. Everybody's like, how did you make the jump? And it's crazy because I like, I knew two years ago, I was going to make the jump. Like in my family, which is, which is why it kind of made it kind of, it was a damp reaction for most of my family and friends. Most (laughs) most of them were kind of like, yeah, they were like, finally, (laughs) they're like, finally, you've been talking about this for two and a half years that you're going to leave and start a company. Finally, you actually did it. And now that, because I'm just really intentional and planned everything out to where I thought about these things and thought about not necessarily the idea of bite check. I think the idea of what bite check is today didn't really fully develop until the middle of this summer, but the idea of starting my own thing came about a while ago. And just, I started collecting skills and ideas of, of what I would do to go about it the right way. And I think that helped out a lot. It was, you know, being tactical sometimes is it's okay to move a little bit slow um, at, at certain times. People try to rush too many times, I think. No, I, I, li- I like that approach. I, I really love the idea of, of being, uh, you know, not impulsive, but plan for an action and, and having an action plan and being really intentional and uh, because it's, it's a tough journey. And if you jump on it and if you are, you're never going to be prepared enough and you think you planned and your plan goes out of the way. But I think it's, it's the journey of learning on, on how to plan or how to think on your feet right. and how to replan and never get knocked down and always you know raising up one more time then they knock you down exactly that's just it's all about is just keep going 
Yeah. And if, if you want to give maybe two or three advice of people that maybe want to do the leap and maybe don't, don't feel like it, well, well, what's your thought process be, be, before jumping and deciding, I'm going to start something new, I'm going to start something, an idea? How do, how do you uh, go through that process so that people can maybe learn a little bit, like a mini mastermind, we make a mini 10 <laughs> minutes mastermind? <laughs> yeah. No, I have, I have a lot of ideas about this. One of the things I found this summer is that even though I'm talking about how hard this is and how you need to be methodical with it, if you have a plan, it's actually not that difficult to start a business and to run a business. It's If you plan it out, you can just follow the plan and a lot of this stuff you can get going. Um, so, But I would tell people is that, you know, it's one of the greatest things you'll ever do, but do it the right way so that you can actually enjoy it. And the first thing I would say is get some domain experience. Like, mm-hmm. No, I, I see far too often, and 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 this is this is a little um, competitive nature in me. And frankly, the competitors of bite check. This is what happened: is people that don't know an industry, they didn't know audit, or they don't know necessarily cybersecurity compliance. They just went through an audit maybe one time. They go out and try to create a product around it, right. and it's it's difficult to do that because. When you know an industry, when you know the ins and outs of the industry, you know some of the nuances, you know some of those landmines, you know some of those things to look out for. And I think that's really important is, you know, work around your industry, understand what and and use people too often think about, I don't want to work for corporate for too long. I don't want to do this. But it's like, right. use that time to do some research, do some reconnaissance. You get to talk to customers. That's the most important thing you can do as an entrepreneur is actually be able to talk to customers. Do it while you're getting paid from someone else. <laughs> <laughs> until, I like until that idea. Out, I, like, I think it's very smart. <laughs> you know, just you, you get, that, get that experience, get those steps through under somebody else's umbrella, make those mistakes. And then you can really find out is, is my idea worth it? Are, are people talking about this problem and right. do you think they would, they would want to pay for it? Once you, once you have some of that experience, it's figuring out what don't you know. So starting a business, especially a cybersecurity business, unfortunately, you're not going to do cybersecurity a lot. You got to do a lot more things. And I tell people all the time, I'm like, I, I started a cybersecurity business because I like the cloud and I love messing around in the cloud. And there's days I don't even get to touch the cloud <laughs> because I'm doing 25 other things. And it's like, you have to understand that that's going to happen. So where are your weaknesses? What do you need to go learn? Who do you need to go learn from? If you've never done anything in marketing and you want to start a company, guess what? You need to go learn some marketing because that's a very important part of your job as a, as a CEO, as an entrepreneur. Right. If you've never understood legal structures of how to set up an LLC or Inc or understanding how that stuff works. And and you need to go do some research because these are all things that are going to take up an insane amount of your time. Or be expensive. Or be insanely expensive because if you need to hire people, you can't go with a corporate mindset. Oh, I I missed that. I'm going to hire somebody and and that I'm going to hire somebody. And then you find that it's like, how am I going to afford <laughs> yep. 100K and I haven't even started the company? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So that's where you need, to, you need to be honest with yourself. What are my weaknesses? What don't I know? And go do some research. You know, I, And the cool thing about LinkedIn, the cool thing about our society today with YouTube and everything else is you can learn anything on the internet right. and you can learn it pretty quickly from experts, from people that are literally doing these things and doing them very well. So like, don't, that's the, that's the other, that, that piece of advice goes with, with this piece of advice of not suffering in silence, you know, too often people try to solve problems on their own. And mm-hmm. I, I have a theory that there is not a problem that I, that I will experience personally that someone else hasn't went through. Right. Um, I think, all of my problems are not unique. And that's a little bit about one of my core values of not taking myself too seriously, where I just don't think I'm doing something that amazing and that cool that it's the first time someone has ever experienced this problem. So I know every time I have a problem, I'm like, I'm going right to Google. And I'm going to see if somebody else has had the same problem before. And I think it just goes back to like in cybersecurity, especially when you get into engineering, that's how you solve problems is you just yeah. go to Google and it's like, all right. And search a lot. Who, uh, who else had the problem? And even if it's like a tangible problem similar to you, you can learn something and be like, oh, let me try that. And that's the same way I think about the business is you have to fill those gaps and you have to fill them with knowledge when you're a startup because you can't hire anybody. So it has right. to be you that, that does that. And then, and then the last thing I would say is don't skip the steps. Don't skip the steps of starting a business. Too often people want to go from, I have an idea to, I want to sell a product. 
well, maybe you should write a business plan in there because that's yeah. a part of one of the first steps of all of this. And then when, after you write your business plan, have somebody take a look at it, share it with someone else, make sure you get some input and don't be afraid to do the two months of planning to grow a business for 10 years because too often we try to skip right to the, the business Doing. process. And now you didn't do any of the planning and you're running all these landmines that you would have came out if you would have did the planning. So, you know, don't skip the hard, don't skip those steps that are boring that, you know, don't get all the glamor, spend the, spend the hours it takes to write out your business plan, spend the time it takes to plan things out. And, and once you do that, you know, you're going to be confident in making that leap. It's not going to feel like a leap anymore. It's going to feel like you're just doing something that makes a lot of sense. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I totally can relate. And also, if you don't have a, a structure plan, you're gonna get destroyed whenever you talk with investors and VC oh, yeah. and other stuff. It's like uh, they're gonna destroy you. They they see this day in and day out. And if you're not yep. like on top of your game for your plan, you're gonna get destroyed. Yep, and that's why I tell that. people a lot too. Is they they don't realize that if you do it right, you know, I'm I'm uh, I have some ideas on VC and, and and funding and all that stuff, and we don't have to get into that. But you know, people will give out money. Um, you'll you can get some money for your idea if you do things the right way. But too often we try to skip. People just skip all the steps. They skip the important the stuff. The shiny products. Yeah, they just want to go right to that, and it's like you know, if you want to start a company and you're an engineer, I'm sorry to break the bad news to you. Like coding is going to be one of the least important things that you do unfortunately (laughs) like it's it's if you create the best product ever but no one sees it you're not going to have a successful business so you have to do all these other things that are way more important than just focusing on the tech which the tech is fun and that's what's going to get you to grow but you got to do all these other things to make sure that you can grow and i think that's the part that about entrepreneurship is you have to be able to be willing to put in those little steps that lead to the bigger things Hey, Francesco here. A very quick message from our sponsor and then we return back. This podcast is brought to you by the generosity of NSC42 Limited, your cybersecurity partner. Cybersecurity is complex and different for every organization, and you need the best tailored service to make sure your customer's data is safe and sound so you can focus on what's important, focusing on your clients and bringing the best and safest experience. NSC42 Limited can help you during your cloud transformation, cybersecurity assessment for your compliance checklist on premise and on the cloud. Want to know more? Visit www.nsc42.co.uk to get your free quote. And I see this as an investment. It's like it's like a mini MBA. For yeah. me, I always see in this journey as a mini MBA, uh, you're going to learn a lot of stuff that's it's, it's real. You're going to learn from your own pain <laughs> and from talking yeah. to people that are actually doing this stuff for real rather than going to a school and having somebody teaching you. There's nothing wrong with that. But yeah. ultimately, you have to test these things in real life. So why not going directly and straight forward? But I really like your idea of, of connecting with people. And actually, how did you use LinkedIn on, on you know, creating that network, creating that connection, circling back? How did you grow your uh, LinkedIn profile all the way to becoming a top voice? Yeah, it's, um, it was pretty crazy that I got top voice because it, at the start of this year, I wasn't really active on LinkedIn. Uh, even going all the way through about April, March, April timeframe, I wasn't active. The plan if you read any startup book or any kind of the lean startup methodology, it says to get out of the building. You got to get out of the building. Mm -hmm. You got to go talk to customers. And that was my plan this summer was to be really active in the Miami tech community and be around. And then a global pandemic happens and there's no more in person. So I realized the only thing I can do to grow this authority, grow this personal brand was to get active on LinkedIn. So, you know, I, I went out and I found this LinkedIn playbook course that I bought through a guy. This is where you can go back and just find gems and information on the internet without having to go to school or going to <laughs> university or anything. This guy named Justin Welsh on LinkedIn, he, he, he's always constantly posting, gives out great advice, but he has a LinkedIn playbook. It's only 50 bucks. And it was, he gave me the step-by-step of what to do to grow your network grow your your kind of following on LinkedIn and I followed it and my whole I had I had two initial goals I I said I wanted to make sure that when I launched bite check whenever that would be I had a network of people that would care about bite check I was connected to people that were in the cloud security and compliance space that was one of my goals 
My other goal was that I realized while I was at my past job, I stopped mentoring. I stopped giving back because I was so busy, quote unquote, busy. Um, and it's just, you're not really busy. I don't think, I think you just don't manage people. People are never really busy. We just don't manage our time. Well, you know, no one really works eight complete hours each day. We're on Slack, we're on email, we're doing LinkedIn, we're doing all this other stuff. You're not actually working for eight consecutive hours. So everybody has time. And I realized like, I need, you can make time. Yeah. I was like, you know, I need to give back to the community. I need a mentor. I didn't make it to this level. I didn't learn the things I learned just to sit around and not give my knowledge back. So I was like, right. LinkedIn's a way I can do that. I can get really active. I can meet people. And I just went all in and used it to as a platform. And, you know, as I started writing, I, people started reacting and they started, you know, saying, you know, wanting to hear more about what I said. So, you know, I just kept, kept doing it, kept growing. And it's been, it's been just an amazing return on the investment from the time that I put in from the LinkedIn top voice was great, but the relationships that I built Right. on that platform have been amazing. You know, some of my first early customers were from directly from LinkedIn connections where we just met and became really good friends. And they ended up being early customers of Bike Check. Also, you know, I'm on a few boards, all came from LinkedIn. I'm on a startup. I'm on a board of a, another startup where I'm an advisory member of the board from LinkedIn. And I tell people all the time, the information that I know now isn't that much more than what I knew before March. Like, I, I feel like I know a little bit more because I've been running, I know a lot more about business, but mm -hmm. from a cybersecurity and compliance perspective, it's pretty marginal what I know more. The only difference is more people know that I know it now because right. I just wasn't, I was, I'm talking about it. But before I knew all this stuff, just no one knew and no one cared because I didn't <laughs> tell anyone. <laughs> um, so we were just saying that uh, connecting and growing organically, growing through LinkedIn connection yeah. and, and letting other people know that you know this stuff and yeah. getting that connection and getting that ball rolling. And a lot of people don't use social media for, for those things. They say it's social media is a waste of time. And yeah. I keep on telling them like, no, you, you're using social media wrongly <laughs> if it's a waste of time. Yeah. I think, you know, maybe the... The t right now, the Twitters, the Instagrams, you know, the TikToks of those world, this world, those might be a waste of time. And the reason I think is because those are um, networks that are filled with content. People are mm -hmm. constantly producing content on Instagram. You know, you just take a picture of your breakfast, then you can take a picture of you, your kids. By the time it's 10 a.m., you have 30 posts already done. <laughs> and but LinkedIn is different right now. And I think it's only right now. I think if you're in cybersecurity, you have about a year and a half to get active on LinkedIn and take advantage right. of this because people are going to figure it out. It's going to get saturated like these other networks. But right now, very few people post on LinkedIn. Most people are passive users. They're just liking or sharing. They're not really actually producing content, which means if you're one of the few people producing content, you're going to stand out. You're just going to because there's not a lot of us producing content on LinkedIn right. from a cybersecurity perspective. So I tell especially job seekers, like, don't, let LinkedIn be a digital version of your resume. That's not what it should be. That should be a live look at who you are, what you care about, what you're currently working on, what are you, who, who do you interact with, what's your network? And that's the thing people don't realize. I tell people all the time, an easy trick on LinkedIn to begin to grow your following. Pick three or four active people on LinkedIn that are in your industry that constantly post and comment on every time they post and watch what happens. Yeah. Watch what happens to your network. Watch how now you are going to be affiliated with these people that are big people in your industry. Every time they post, all of their followers are going to see you in the comments. They're going to start connecting with you. And now people are going to assume you know the same things as those guys yeah. or girls that you're commenting on because you're always in their ecosystem. And it's that easy. And there, people always talk about these stories back in the days where you'd go to a conference and you try to brush shoulders with someone and run into someone that was big and be like, oh, hey, how's it going? I'm so-and-so. You can literally do that on LinkedIn every day <laughs> with the biggest person that you want. You can do it at any moment and comment on their stuff and interact with them and build a relationship and people just aren't taking advantage of it. But, you know, LinkedIn has been huge for me. It's a great way to test things out. You know, I test a lot of marketing things out via my own post. Right. And then when I see that they work, I'm like, all right, we're going to use that with the company <laughs> a little bit. Um, and that's a, it's a great way to test things out because it's, it's free. It's free to post. It's free to do those things. Um, and the other thing about LinkedIn that, that I, that I really like is, is, is about, it's, it's the relationship building, but it's, 
it's, you know, you're talking to real people and especially in our space, in the business to business space, you know, you're you, people that are in this space live on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. They're going to be on LinkedIn. So the people that you want to talk to are going to be there. So it's a, it's a great place, man. I've, I've enjoyed growing the network there and meeting with people and, and just being able to have discussions in the community with people that care about the same stuff I care about. Right. So the last, the last traditional thing on the, on the podcast is, Uh, fundamentally a good, we, we, we love to go to leave everybody with a very fuzzy and warm message. Uh, we talk about the struggle. We talk about, you know, the challenge on cloud security, new words. And, you know, let's, let's leave everybody with a very positive message because that's, that's, especially during this pandemic and this year, everybody has been, you know, pushed yeah. down. So I, I like to leave everybody with a very positive message. Which one will be yours, AJ? Yeah, I think uh, what I like to remind people is that one of the things that stops someone from accomplishing a goal that they want to accomplish is that you put way too much pressure on yourself. You, you, you give yourself way too much pressure. And the problem is that we overestimate what we can get done in a very short period of time. We think like, oh, I, I can get this done in three weeks. I'm super excited. Going to knock it out. But We, and then we, on the, on the flip side of that, we underestimate what we can get done over a longer period of time. We don't say I can do this in three months or six months because that's too long. It's too far out to vision. And, you know, you, you see a new goal, you're like, I'm going to get that cert or I'm going to learn this uh, programming language. And like, I'm going to do it in four weeks. I'm going to learn Python. And it's like, all right, well, two weeks in, you're going to realize that that's not going to happen. And that's going to cause you to quit. That's going to cause you to stop. And I would encourage people, give yourself more grace, give yourself more time to accomplish goals, and you'll be surprised at what you can accomplish. Uh, don't put so much pressure on yourself that you're trying to accomplish things so fast. You're overestimating your, your skill set, and you think you're going to be able to learn a really hard topic in a few days, but give yourself a three months and watch how much you'll get done. You'll be surprised at how you'll actually be able to achieve these goals. So anybody out there, you're setting your 2021 resolutions. Whatever you come up with first, as far as the timeline that you're going to complete a goal, give yourself an additional two months. And I promise you, you're going to accomplish that goal. You're going to be able to do it because you gave yourself more time and you gave yourself some grace and you gave yourself the ability to actually accomplish the goal, which is, which is what we all want to do. And, it's, and, and I think, uh, you know, that we live in a generation where you get that instant gratification. You want that ah, immediate, I did it. And you want that, you know, that ability to to say you accomplish something really fast, but you got to be able to just trust yourself to put in the work, do little tiny steps every single day, focus on those little steps and the end result's going to be great. Um, so my encouraging thing message and, and positive note is that if you're setting a goal, you can accomplish it and you will accomplish it. Give yourself enough grace to do that. Give yourself more time. Don't underestimate how much you can accomplish over a long period of time. I like that. I like the giving yourself permission and giving yourself time and, and proper preparing and proper planning and, and not be scared of failure and not be scared of yep. failure and replan and, and having that plan at hand and not giving up. That's, I think, ultimately the entrepreneur superpower, not giving up. <laughs> Yeah. AJ, it's been an absolute pleasure. If if you guys want to go and check by check from AJ, just please uh, go and, and check the website. Where they can find you, AJ, by the way? You can uh, find me on LinkedIn. I um, I still carve out four hours every week to mentor people. So if you reach out to me uh, and send me a message, I will send you a link to find some time on my calendar and, and, I'll, and I'll help and mentor you and, and give you advice any way that I can. So you'll find me on LinkedIn. You can find my website, uh, www.bitecheck.com. And, um, you know, we put out a lot of content. So if you see me on LinkedIn, you'll, you'll see, you'll see some content <laughs> there. So, uh, uh, yeah, that's the best place to find me. Amazing. Thank you very much, AJ. And everybody, thank you very much for listening in and stay safe and stay cloud safe. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, consider leaving us a review or sponsoring us on Patreon. It helps us bring on amazing guests and keep the podcast alive and free. Consider supporting us at www.patreon.com forward slash CSCP and watch other episodes at www.cybercloudpodcast.com. Mm -hmm.